This series will strengthen your faith. It's going to give you a foundation of doctrine. Why do we believe what we believe? It's going to encourage you. It's going to challenge you. It's going to convict you. And I really am excited about this message this morning. So we're going to call the message this morning, Separated Unto the Gospel. Separated Unto the Gospel. We see that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The title this morning, Separated Unto the Gospel. Now in Bible study this morning, we went through who the Apostle Paul was. So who was the Apostle Paul? He was a Jew. He was a Roman citizen. He was raised under the Old Testament law. He was a Pharisee. The Apostle Paul, before he was saved, was a zealous persecutor of Christians. The Bible says, we read it this morning, he would go to their houses and he would, he would hail them and commit them to prison if they were Christians. And the Bible says, and um, it was Acts chapter 9 verse 1, that he went breathing uh, threatenings and slaughter to the church. He was a zealous persecutor of Christians, but he was a convert to Jesus Christ. Something happened in the life of the Apostle Paul, and he experienced the gospel, the transformational gospel of Jesus Christ. His life was forever changed. He became a serious student of the scriptures. He was an apostle. He was a preacher. He was a missionary. The Apostle Paul was persecuted for his faith in Jesus Christ. He was the persecutor. He became the persecuted. He was a mentor and a teacher of Christian leaders. He was an inspired author of Scripture. God used him to write many books of the Bible. And then he entered his life as a martyr. As you read that very first verse, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Understand who Paul was. It's going to make a difference as you go into the book of Romans to understand where he came from. He was a Jew raised under the Old Testament law. He couldn't keep the law. He tried, but he realized he couldn't keep it. The more, the more he tried, the more guilty he became under the law. We'll get to that when we get to Romans chapter 3 and, and a little bit past that. Not only is Paul part of verse number 1, but look at Romans chapter 1 verse 1 again. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. So I want you to remember now who Jesus Christ is. Now, when we're talking about Paul, we said, remember who Paul was. When we're talking about Jesus, I'll say, remember who Jesus is. The difference is that Paul died and went to heaven. His body did not go to heaven yet. It will one day in the resurrection. But Jesus is different. Jesus died, and three days later, he did rise again. So we, just, you can say it either way, but I'm saying it this way just to, to focus on the fact that he did rise again. Remember who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. We went through this last week in Bible study, but let me remind you of a couple things. God in heaven said that Jesus is the Son of God. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine the sky opening up, heaven opening up, and hearing this voice? Some people said it sounded like thunder, saying, this is my Son. Right? People around think, whoa. Many, many times... Well, several times in, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures, God said that. But many, many times, Jesus is called the Son of God. Satan knew that Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection proved that Jesus is the Son of God. And let me give you a couple thoughts. This is amazing. Jesus was born to a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross. He rose again three days later, and he ascended to heaven. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus came through a door marked no entrance. And he left earth through a door marked no exit. Amazing. He came to the earth through a virgin's womb. And Jesus left the earth through an empty tomb. What a Savior. What a, what a person. What The Son of God. Remember who Jesus is. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. What's the word gospel mean? Well, gospel means good news or glad tidings. The book of Romans, this is an amazing book of glad tidings. But Paul is saying here, listen, I'm Paul. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, and I'm called to be an apostle, and I am separated. I've lived my life. I'm dedicating my life to the gospel, the good news of God. The good news, the story of Jesus, is a story 
of good news. You can't get past that. His birth was good news. Remember the angels in Luke chapter 2? The angels said unto them, they're talking to the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. Good news, the beginning of the gospel of great joy which shall be to all people. What is that good news? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The birth of Jesus Christ was good news. His resurrection was good news. I mean, I'm kind of under, understating some things here. You know that's good news. It's kind of hard to even say it in the right way. It's such good news. Acts chapter 13, verse 28. I'm going to give you several verses as we kind of go through this. Acts chapter 13, verse 28, talking about the resurrection. All right, so the Apostle Paul is, I believe this is the Apostle Paul explaining it. Acts 13, verse 28, And though they found no cause of death in him, they desired, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. What a statement that is. Talking about Jesus, they, they crucified him. I said, Paul said this, I'm, it's one of the apostles, and I pulled this out. I'm not exactly sure which one it was that said this. But God raised him from the dead. Acts 13, 31, the Bible says, And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings. Did you catch that? These glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children. And that he hath raised up Jesus again. Hey, let me tell you some good news this morning. The gospel's good news. First of all, the Savior was born. And that's good news. We celebrate that. We're at Christmas time, we celebrate it all year. Hey, but there's gooder, gooder news. <laughs> there's more good news. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You, you see this here. We declare unto you glad tidings. In that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The birth of Jesus Christ is good news. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news. Salvation of Jesus Christ, not that he was saved, but that he provides salvation, is good news. Acts chapter 4 verse 11 gives us a, a verse that helps us to understand this so very well. This is kind of an introduction. You're welcome to turn there. You're welcome to just listen. Acts chapter 4 verse 11. This is the stone, talking about Jesus, which was set at naught of you builders. The word naught means nothing. You didn't, you didn't count it for anything. This is the stone which was, which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 talks about this good news, this, this salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We get saved by Jesus Christ. What good news this is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is such good news. His birth was good news. His resurrection was good news. His salvation is good news. Romans 10, 13, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Anybody. It doesn't matter where you are or where you came from. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you trust Jesus Christ, you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. All right, some of you are looking at me like, hey, I didn't know we were going to get started quite so fast this morning. Kind of like a calf looking at a new gate this morning. I've got a lot to get through this morning. I'm really excited to get it out. So I'm just going to keep on going this morning. And I, I hope this morning to impress upon your hearts the good news of the gospel. His birth was good news. His resurrection was good news. His salvation is good news. Hey, listen to this. His promise of heaven is good news. What? I mean, all of those things are good news. But if we were living here on this earth without the promise of heaven, really, there really would be no point of living. There really would be no point of anything. But there is a promise of heaven. John chapter 14, Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said this in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And listen to this. Jesus said this. He said it to his disciples. He says it to us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'm preparing a place for you in my Father's house as many men are many mansions. And I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm coming again, and I'm going to bring you back to be with me. What a thought! 
The birth of Christ is good news. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is good news. The salvation of Jesus Christ is good news. The promise of heaven is good news. In fact, there is no other news in the world that's good news like the gospel is good news. Now, I understand something. You've heard this before. If this was the very first time you heard this, you might, you might respond just a little bit different. I'm not trying to get anybody to run around and throw songbooks in the air or anything, but I just want you to think about this. Landing a man on the moon was good news, but not good enough to get anyone to heaven. There's been some good news in our history, but there's no good news like this good news. The end of World War II was good news. I'm looking around, I don't think anybody was alive here at the end of World War II. But that was good news, but not good enough to bring peace forever. The discovery of a smallpox vaccine. Okay, I'm going way back in history now. That was good news, but not good enough to cleanse a heart from sin. Listen, there's been some good news in our world, and even good news in our lifetime, but none of that news is good news like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Listen to this. The gospel takes a broken, empty heart filled with sin and introduces it to a loving Savior who heals the brokenness with peace, replaces the sin with righteousness, and fills the emptiness with love. What a gospel we have. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto not just the gospel, but... There's a couple more words on there. Did you see that at the end of Romans chapter 1, verse 1? The gospel of God. Now there's good news, but then there's the good news of God. There's the gospel, but then there's the gospel of God. The gospel of God is the gospel of His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Talking about the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Understand this, the gospel of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll talk more about these verses whenever we get to them. I do love this. When you see this phrase, for I am not ashamed or not to be ashamed of, you realize there is no reason if I was to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ that I would ever be embarrassed for proclaiming it because it always does what God said it would do. The gospel of God. Sometimes it appears impossible to move forward for God. Have you ever felt that way? Sometimes we get discouraged when we think about Satan's opposition to God and, and his people. You ever been discouraged? You ever been discouraged because when you look around and you see the prince of the power of this, the, the, the air and the prince of this world seems like he's fighting against God. And sometimes it seems like he's winning. Now if you've been around for a while... You remember when the Supreme Court made prayer illegal in schools. If you've been around for a while, you remember when the Supreme Court made the Bible illegal in schools. If you've been around for a while, you remember when... Now, I have to back that up and say the Bible is not illegal in schools, but the, the interpretation of that is often... Is often misinterpreted, and students are told they're not allowed to bring a Bible to school when that is actually not the case. You can take your Bible to school. I do believe, though the Supreme Court says that it cannot be sponsored by the, you know, by the school. But there was a day when it was. There was a day when classrooms started their day with prayer and a Bible verse. But if you've been around for a while, you know that the Supreme Court made both of those illegal. You remember if you've been around for a while when the Supreme Court made a law requiring every state to allow the murder of unborn children. We just celebrate it is the wrong word for that, but we just observe another anniversary of that terrible, terrible decision. If you've been around for a while, you remember when the Supreme Court made homosexual marriages legal. Now, you don't have to be around for that long to remember that one. That was just a couple years ago. You know, sometimes it appears impossible to move forward for God. And sometimes we get discouraged when we think about Satan's opposition to God and, and to us, his people. But wait a minute. You see here, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to something. Separated unto the gospel of God. 
Hey, this isn't just good news. This isn't just the gospel. This is the gospel of God we're talking about. The gospel of God is more powerful than any opposition. Why? Because it's the gospel of God. We're talking about God's gospel, the good news from God. The gospel, listen to this, it cannot be changed, canceled, or revoked by emperors, kings, presidents, or courts. You can't change it. There's nothing they can do to the gospel of God. They can do all kinds of things to change culture. They can cancel culture if they want to, but they can't cancel the gospel of God. The gospel will outlive any political organization or government structure that fights it, ignores it, or tries to relinquish it to the archives of ancient history. The gospel isn't ancient history, although it was part of ancient history. The gospel is now. The gospel is alive. The gospel is alive. Why? Because Jesus is alive. The gospel is powerful because Jesus is powerful. The gospel is transformational because Jesus is transformational. The gospel can take a drunkard and change him into a preacher. The gospel can take a drug addict and change him into a saint and a murderer into a missionary. The gospel can cover the stains of past sins, break the chains of present temptations, and prevent the pains of future decisions. Oh, the gospel is so powerful. The gospel of God. The gospel is the true story of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the miracle of His virgin birth. The gospel is the truth of His sinless life. The gospel is the declaration of His vicarious death. It means He died in your place. It's the affirmation of His bodily resurrection and the promise of His glorious return. That's the gospel of God. The gospel gives you hope because it's the story of a powerful Savior who fought the impossible battle with death and won the gospel gives you peace because it's the story of a risen Savior who's with you every day. The gospel gives you joy because it's the story of a loving Savior who paid the highest price for you to live with Him in heaven forever. The gospel gives you a reason to live because it's the story of a personal Savior who created you to spend time with Him and who died in your place to make that possible. Oh, hey, listen, there's a reason to live. Suicides are up with all of the COVID restrictions and uh, all the things that are going on. But listen, you've got a reason to live. You've got a reason to live because you have a personal Savior. And He has a reason for your life. He wants to spend time with you. He created you to spend time with Him. And beyond that, He died for you to be able to do that. He died in your place, a personal Savior, to give you a reason to live. The gospel's God's good news for the human race. God's good news started with the promise of a coming Savior. A Savior that would also be a sacrifice for our sins. And not only a sacrifice, but the sacrifice. God's good news started with His promise of a Savior. A Savior that would be God in the body of a man. Try to think that one through for a minute. You've heard it before. We, we, we know this verse. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. But if you try to stop and think about this God in the body of a man, it just blows your mind. A Savior, the promise of a Savior. There would be God in the body of man. There would be God with us. There would be a sacrifice for our sins. God's good news got better with the announcement of the birth of the Savior. Now, God announced the gospel to both Mary and Joseph before Jesus was born. You know the story. God announced the birth of the Savior to Mary first. Luke 1, And behold, the angel came and said, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. Son and Highest, both capitalized. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. See, the, the good news of the gospel just keeps getting better. started with the promise of the Savior. got better with the announcement of the birth of the Savior. God announced the birth of the Savior to Joseph in Matthew 1.21. The, the angel said to Joseph, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. The announcement of a Savior. The gospel just kept getting better as you go through the Bible. God announced the birth of the Savior to those shepherds. 
the same night Jesus was born. You probably know this part of Luke chapter 2, right? And verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you... What's that word? Two words. Five words, actually. Good tidings of great joy. This is the gospel. This is the gospel, not just promise, but now announce the birth of Jesus has come for unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God's news was great at the beginning, the promise of a Savior. It got better with the announcement of the birth of the Savior. But God's good news, God's gospel got even better with the demonstration of the miraculous life of the Savior. Could you just imagine living back then? Okay, so Domino's didn't deliver. It would have been a difficult time to live. I understand that. But the fact that the Savior was there, and listen to this verse. Luke 7, 22 describes it. The Savior, the, the miraculous life of the Savior, Jesus answering, said unto them, Go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard. See, John the Baptist sent some of his followers to Jesus and saying, Are you the one that we've been waiting for or should we look for another? And, John, and Jesus said to John, Go tell John what you see. And he said, Look, tell John what things you've seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and to the poor the gospel is preached. Listen, you have in the, your midst somebody different than's ever been here before because I'm the Savior. God's news just kept getting better. It reached the pinnacle of greatness with the observation of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Savior. I mean, God's news was good that He was going to send a Savior. And it just kept getting better, the fact that the Savior had come. But now you get to the point where this, this good news just got to the point where it just can't get any better than this. Listen, listen to this. Acts chapter 4 verse 10 describes it well. The, the, the preachers, I think this is Peter and John, they're preaching there in Acts chapter 4 verse 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. All right, so I'm coming down into your space. All right, is, you getting nervous here? All right, Look, listen to this. We talk about him dying and coming back to life like, yeah, okay. Because we've heard of that before. Here are the disciples preaching this and they say, look, Jesus Christ did these miracles. You crucified him and God brought him back to life. And they'd have been like, <gasps> people don't come back to life. In this case, he did. Because he's not just a people. Right? He is the son of God. He's gone in the flesh, in the body of a man. Acts chapter 4 verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. We read this earlier. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, changed everything. Every one of the disciples, the apostles, right? Except for maybe John. I'm not totally sure about John. We'll find out one of these days. Died preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, nobody's going to die for something that they know is a lie. I mean, you get, you get enough pressure on somebody. If they're trying to push a lie on you, at some point they'll back off and say, okay, no, 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 I made that up. But every one of the disciples, they went to their death preaching that Jesus rose again from the dead. Why? Because it happened. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Oh, I love the gospel. Romans 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. We looked at Paul already. We looked at Jesus Christ already. We looked at the gospel. That means good news. We looked at the fact that it's the gospel of God. Not just any good news, but the good news of God. But what about this separated unto the gospel of God? I want you to understand something. Paul's life was transformed by the gospel of God. Do you remember what he was before he was saved? He was Saul, and he was killing people like you and I. That's exactly what he's doing. If our church was back then, or if Saul was right now, either one of those things happening, Saul would be looking for you and me with permission from the church of the time, the organized church, the church leadership. He had permission, and he would be looking for us to arrest us and kill us. If we lived back then, or if he lived now. 
You've got to understand that. That's who Paul was. He hated Christians. He hated the name of Jesus Christ. He's doing everything he could to get rid of this, this religious cult, he believed. Christians. They weren't called Christians yet, followers of Jesus Christ. He's doing everything he could. He was killing people like you and me. But something happened. Something amazing happened to the point where we saw this morning in our, Sunday, in our Bible study class, in our Sunday school class, he was killing people in the first part of chapter 9, verse 1. But by chapter 9, verse 20, he's preaching the name of Jesus Christ. And by the end of the chapter, they're looking for him to kill him. What happened? I'm telling you what happened. It was the transformational gospel of Jesus Christ. See, Paul knew about the gospel. He understood the gospel. He accepted the gospel. And then he dedicated his life to the gospel. Where are you on that? Do you know about the gospel? Do you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the price for your sins, and that if you would trust Him as your Savior, He would forgive you of your sins and save you? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know that? Do you know about the gospel? Do you understand it? Do you realize that that is not just talking to somebody else? It's talking about you. For whosoever, anybody, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We'll get to that in Romans. It's just awesome. He knew about the gospel and he understood the gospel. But he did this. He accepted the gospel. It wasn't just something that he knew about. And hey, that's good for you. We sing that song. It was good for brother Moses. It was good. It wasn't just good for somebody else. He accepted it. He accepted the death of Jesus Christ as a payment for his sins. He accepted the resurrection of Jesus Christ as fact. And he accepted God's free gift of eternal life. That's the gospel. Paul knew about the gospel, he understood the gospel, and he accepted the gospel. We looked this morning, we don't have the exact um, time where Paul stopped, and, and we don't know exactly what he said during that three days where he was blind and having these conversations with God. But we see that he hated Jesus Christ. A couple of verses later, he's baptized, showing that he had already gotten saved. A couple of verses later, he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see a transformed life. He knew the gospel. He understood the gospel. He accepted the gospel. Listen, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the only way to do that is by accepting the gospel. You can't do it another way. You can't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and accept, expect Him to save you by being good or by going to church or by any other list of things. We've been preaching about that on Sunday nights. You can't, you can't earn your way to heaven, but you can accept the gospel. If you've accepted the gospel, you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are, according to the Bible, saved. Amen. I love this verse. I just read it this week, and I'll try to quote it for you. For there hath no condemnation. I'll have to look it up. It's, it's just, it's real easy. It's in... Romans chapter 8. I was going to get close, but I was going to mess up one of the verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's accepting the gospel. Not by works, accepting what God did. But I want to go further than that. Let me ask you this morning. Do you know the gospel? I hope you do. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know the gospel. Because you can't get saved without knowing the gospel. Jesus Christ came to this earth, died on the cross, paid the price for your sins. If you accept his gift of eternal life, you can be saved. That's a very simplified version of the gospel. You know the gospel. All right? Do you understand the gospel? It's for you. Have you accepted the gospel? This is the decision point. If you have, and I hope you have, I'm going to ask you another question. Are you separated unto the gospel? Paul dedicated his life to the gospel. You know, we live in a, in a strange time where this, this last year, 2020, so many things were taken out of our lives, right? We used to watch sports a lot. Most of those were taken out of our life. Uh, we used to, uh, the, the big things, we you know, go to concerts, go to movies, go to entertainment places, all these things, now we don't, we don't go to movies, but this is kind of the thing that we do as, as a culture. All these things taken out of our lives. And what we have found, all this stuff taken out of our lives, and we realize, hey, we can still live. <laughs> There's more to life than just all the entertainment stuff that, 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 was, that was going on. Paul 
knew the gospel, understood the gospel, accepted the gospel, and he dedicated his life to it. He said, I am separated unto the gospel of God. That's what I want to challenge you as we finish this morning. Romans chapter 9, 1 verse 9, the Apostle Paul said, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. I have given my life to be separated to the gospel Verse number 15, Romans 1, 15. So as much as in me is. That's just not like, eh, a little bit here, a little bit there. For as much as in me is. What do you do with for as much as in me is of your life? What do I do with for as much as in me is? That's like I am dedicating my life to this. For as much as in me is. What did he say? For as much as in me is. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel, to you that are at Rome also. Paul said, listen, I'm, I'm Paul. I'm a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, but I'm separated unto the gospel of Christ. I have dedicated my life for the gospel of Christ. Verse number 16, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. If you have not yet accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to do it right away. You don't know if you have tomorrow. None of us knows. You don't know if you'll live through tomorrow. You don't know if you have next week. If you have not yet accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, the fact that he died on the cross, rose again, paid the price for your sin, if you have not accepted that for yourself personally, you need to do that. It's the only way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Most people this morning listening to this message have already done that. So the rest of this message is for you, and we're just this close to being done. Actually, there. If you find yourself frustrated or depressed, I'm talking to Christians now. If you find yourself frustrated or depressed, with the way things are going in the world, <laughs> okay, I'll raise my hand for all of us. You need to focus your attention back on the gospel. What's wrong? We have lost our focus. As Christians, we have turned our focus to so many other things. Now we found that we don't have to have all those other things to live. And we may be finding out as we lose freedoms. Uh, we, we talked about some of the freedoms that the Supreme Court has taken away. Now by executive order we're losing freedoms. And as, as you see these freedoms going, instead of being depressed, instead of being worried, let's realize, hey, I've been focusing on the wrong stuff and focus back on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Listen to what Paul said. But none of these things move me. Talking about the stuff we've just been talking about. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. This, this stuff doesn't bother me. None of these things move me. He lived under a Roman emperor that hated Christians and was persecuting Christians. And none of these things move me. How could you say that? That would bother me like crazy. That, well, that wasn't his focus. He was living in a jail cell, lost his freedom, lost all of his earthly possessions, most of them. He even asked one of his followers, one of his friends, to bring a coat that he left somewhere else. He just didn't have much. None of these things move me. And then he talks about, I'm going to finish my course with joy. I'm going to have joy as I serve God. Why? When you get to the, the end of that verse, this is Acts chapter 20, verse 24, because he's testifying the gospel, the grace of God. I get to share the gospel. When your focus is on the gospel, you can have joy regardless of what's going on around you. This is an amazing truth. This is a truth that Christians in 2021 desperately need to hear because... Where our taxes are going up and our savings are going down and the cost of gas is going up and, and there's a lot of changes going on. If we focus on that stuff, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be frustrated. You might even get worried. But I, I'm telling you, when you focus on the gospel, you can go forward with joy regardless of what's going on around you. If, 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 if a good economy is better than a bad economy, right? Yeah, but it can't give you joy. Good leaders are certainly better than bad leaders. 
But neither one of them can give you joy. Gas for less than $2 a gallon is good for your budget, but it won't give you joy. When Christians, including myself, pout and worry because a new president comes into office and immediately starts signing executive orders that are bad for our economy, we realize we've been living for the wrong things. Guilty. Colossians 3.1, the Bible says this. This is the Apostle Paul writing again. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Or Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, in order to be risen with Christ, you've got to first be dead with Christ. The Apostle Paul said that earlier. He said, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. In another place, he said, I die daily. When you get to that point, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Listen to this now. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, talking to live people, but you've died in Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I'm done with this challenge. Our world is desperate. For Christians who are willing to live a life that's separated unto the gospel of God. We're desperate for Christians that would say, instead of living for all the stuff, I want to live for Jesus Christ. The more that's taken away from us, the more we'll find that the gospel of God is the only thing worth living for. Our nation is in the position it's in right now because... A large majority of Christians for the past several generations to chose to live for just about everything except the gospel of God. You heard this phrase, nominal Christian? It means I go by the name, but I don't really do anything about it. That's not living for the gospel, separated to the gospel. Our world, oh, this challenges me. You've seen the math maybe on this. Our world could have been reached a thousand times if every Christian would have simply shared the gospel with one other person. If every Christian would share the gospel with, to specify one person per year. If every Christian would share the gospel with one person. All right, say, say I'm the only Christian. And this year I share the gospel with one person. There's two of us. The next year we both share the gospel with one person and there's four of us. Did you realize that in 34 years every person in the world would hear the gospel and be saved? We could, as Christians, have reached the gospel thousands of times. I mean, how many times have we had an opportunity for 34 years to reach the gospel, preach the gospel? But we're not separated unto the gospel. I want to do this. I want to challenge you to be the generation that brings the gospel of God back to our world. The gospel of God can transform anybody that lives in our time just as much as it transformed Saul, who lived way back when, from being a persecutor of Christians to a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's two decisions this morning. First one is this. If you have not accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to do that. You need to be saved. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The second decision is this, and I challenge you to do this. Would you pray about this? You may have to agonize over this for a while, but would you separate yourself unto the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to live for the gospel? Would you be willing to maybe let some of that other stuff go? I'm not saying go sell everything and, and, and live in the back of your station wagon. Tonight, I'm, I'm going to share a testimony of a man who did that, except it was in 1100, so they didn't have station wagons, but... You'll hear how this one man did that and transformed his, his area with the gospel. But I'm not challenging you to do that. I'm just saying, would you dedicate your life to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in each one of our hearts. As Christians, most of us are guilty for living for all the wrong stuff. Lord, I pray that you would refocus our attention on your gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ would transform a life. Lord, most Christians have never told somebody how to be saved. Most Christians, myself included, Lord, we, we focus so much on things that really, they're not going to matter once we're gone. Lord, I pray that you do a powerful work in our hearts this morning. And I pray that you would help us each to dedicate our lives 
to separate unto the gospel, to live, like Paul said, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Lord, I know every one of us could do more for the gospel, more for the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would convict our hearts and then challenge us and then guide us, show us how we can do that. The piano is going to play. Would you stand? Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed this morning. As you stand and as you spend just a moment with God this morning, are, are you willing to dedicate yourself to the gospel of Jesus Christ? I don't know what that's going to look like exactly. But would you be willing to say, God, I really don't want to live for myself. I want to live for you. None of these things move me. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. How could that look in your life? I'm not saying sell everything. I'm not even saying sell out. But could you take one step closer to living for the gospel of Christ? What would that one step look like? And you don't have to answer to me. This is totally between you and God. But between you and God, what would that one step closer to living for the gospel of God look like in your life? I don't know the answer to that. Would you ask God for direction? God, how would you want me to live? God, I don't want to waste my life. Let me ask you this morning. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you would like for somebody to pray with you and show you how to be saved, would you raise your hand this morning? Anybody? You'd say, I don't know. I don't know I'm saved. I don't know that I've ever accepted God's gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know if I've ever trusted Him as my Savior. But I want to do that this morning. If that's you, raise your hand real high. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to have somebody take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Anybody this morning? Say, I need that. That's what I need. I need to be saved. If I were to die today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven, but I sure would like to know. Anybody this morning you'd say, that's, that's me, I need to know that. What could happen if a group of Christians decided to be separated unto the gospel? What would happen if God used you like he used the Apostle Paul? Okay, so maybe not all of that, but one-tenth of how he used the Apostle Paul. Oh, God wants to use you. God can use you. I don't know exactly, like I said, I don't know how that would look exactly, but are you willing? Are you willing to tell God, God, would you just use me however you want to use me? I tell him that so often. I want God to use my life. I want my life to matter for God. God, would you use me just however you want to? Wouldn't it be an amazing thing when you get to the end of your life to be able to say like the Apostle Paul, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. And I'm ready. I'm ready to meet my Savior because I've been living for Him. What a thought.